Eugeniusz Romer, witam Państwa. Tym razem spotykamy się w Bostonie i mamy wyjątkowego gościa. Jest nim profesor Chris Miller, który jest profesorem Fletcher School na Tufts University, ale myślę Państwu znany jest przede wszystkim z książki Wielka wojna o chipy, która została wydana przez wydawnictwo Prześwity i myślę jest jedną z najważniejszych książek, które ukazały się w ostatnim czasie. Profesor Chris Miller był także autorem artykułu, który pojawił się w 40. numerze Układu Sił. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. So at the beginning, I would like to uh, to ask you to give us a short uh, overview of how an iPhone is produced. So which countries are involved uh, involved in this this process? Well, most iPhones are manufactured in China, but the hard part of making an iPhone actually doesn't happen in China. It happens elsewhere in other countries. Inside of an iPhone, there's a, a battery, there's a display, the screen you can see. But the most uh, valuable and most complex components inside of a phone are the chips inside of it. There's a chip that runs the operating system, a chip that handles the memory, a chip that handles the Wi-Fi, a chip that handles the Bluetooth, dozens of semiconductor devices inside of each iPhone. And most of them are imported into China from Taiwan, from Japan, from Korea, uh, or from other countries to actually manufacture the phone itself. And so if you want to understand where a phone is coming from, you actually don't look at where it's assembled. It's assembled in China, but the most complex pieces are coming from Taiwan, which today manufactures almost all of the most complex chips that end up in an iPhone. And so it's the entire supply chain that you've got to understand if you want to make sense of for example, how an iPhone is made. Yeah, so that's, that, that gives us an impression how uh, globalization is important in terms of producing iPhones. And some people may not consider iPhones uh, cheap, but if we want uh, them not to be very expensive, we need globalization. So do you think this is uh, possible in the near future that uh, those supply chains will be uh, still available, still working, and um, there will be no um, hardships in producing such uh, advanced uh, processors and, and um, machines or phones or computers like, like Apple produces? Well, globalization refers to trade between many different countries, but the biggest change in international trade over the last two decades has been the increase in trade between China on the one hand and the West on the other. And that's been good for a lot of reasons. It's brought us cheaper products, uh, but it creates huge risks if there's some sort of disruption in trade between China and its neighbors. And the, the challenge is that all of the technology we rely on uh, comes either from China or from countries right outside of China, and therefore is highly at risk of disruption in case of some sort of military escalation between China and its neighbors. And it's easier now than almost ever before to imagine uh, that type of military escalation disrupting international commerce. So this is actually happening because uh, right after you published your book, um, Joe Biden introduced his CHIPS Act and uh, imposed sanctions on China in terms of uh, the most advanced, advanced semiconductors. So how did it shape the, the semiconductor market and were the sanctions actually efficient? Well, I think to understand why the U.S. is now focusing on the chip industry, you've got to understand how China started its fixation on the chip industry almost a decade ago. In 2014, Xi Jinping identified chips as what he calls a core technology. And China set up its first uh, government investment fund in the chip industry that same year. So for over a decade, China's been focusing on trying to make advances in the chip industry to become self-sufficient in chip technology. And as China's done that, it's catalyzed a response from other countries, from Taiwan, from Korea, uh, from the United States. And so the U.S. is simultaneously trying to invest in its own chip industry to keep its technological lead ahead of China, uh, but also to uh, stop China from accessing the most advanced capabilities that are produced in the United States or in allied countries, because these capabilities are, are useful in phones and useful for chat GPT. But the reality is that the They're exact same use. technologies are dual use, yeah. exactly. And so they go right into military and intelligence systems as well. So um, even though Joe Biden administration imposed sanctions, Huawei, for example, introduced a uh, latest phone with uh, really small chips inside, way smaller than the, the, the one that, that are allowed by the sanctions to, to produce in China. So what does it mean? Well, I think any sanctions regime is, is never going to be watertight. And certainly this one has been looser than the U.S. government had hoped. There's, there's no chance, I don't think, of completely stopping technological progress in China. China's too big, already too advanced to do so, but the U.S. is hoping to slow it down a bit. And I think the U.S. has been disappointed that it hasn't slowed down China more. 
the good news is that the U.S. is on its own racing ahead with collaboration from Taiwan and from Europe and Japan. All of the advances in AI that we've seen over the past two years have been driven by better and better semiconductors. And so if you look at the, the net balance sheet, I think the U.S. is still in a pretty strong position, but it certainly does want to be slowing China more than it already is. So what if, if the U.S. fails and the, uh, the Chinese uh, win the technological edge in terms of semiconductors, what happens next? Well, the, the, the reason this matters is because chips are at the core of technological advances in almost every sector of the economy. AI will be relevant everywhere, and the key driver of advances in AI are chips, which means that if China is able to produce this core technology undergirding all their technological advances, it's going to be able to write the rules of the technologies of the future. And that's something that worries the United States, but it also worries U.S. allies who are in a lot of ways equally concerned about the implications of a stronger China writing rules that would constrain their future abilities. And actually the Chinese are trying to be self-sufficient in terms of semiconductors. So they are developing or um, um, making arch chip architecture on their own. They are also producing over uh, building foundries and investing a lot of money. Um, so do you think it is possible that China can have like a self-sufficient system of a semiconductor production or will the Chinese still need other nations and other companies? Well, China's going to need a lot more self-sufficient uh, for sure. There's no doubt about that. The question is how far on the path towards self-sufficiency can it get? I think it's already been very impressive how close China is getting to self-sufficiency. By 2027 and 2028, I think China will produce most of the low-end and the mid-range chips that it needs domestically. So the only question is the highest-end chips, the AI processors, for example, what number of those can China produce? And there's real uncertainty around there, but there's no doubt that China's going to be much more self-sufficient in the future than it is today which means that in a, a worst case scenario, a crisis scenario, China's no longer nearly as reliant on us as they used to be, which gives Beijing a lot more room for maneuver in a crisis. How about UV, UV printers, which are produced by ASML? So do you think China can produce such a machine, which is super complicated and also involved uh, a lot of nations, a lot of companies to, to, to produce those UV uh, printers? Of all of the capabilities that China lacks, the ability to produce EUV lithography tools is the most important. China's been trying for now over half a decade to buy these tools from ASML, the Dutch company that's the world's only producer of EUV tools, and thus far the Netherlands has not allowed them to be shipped to China. We know that China's trying to build these tools on its own, but it's going to be extraordinarily difficult. I think China is going to really struggle to produce these tools. And if it does produce a tool like this in five years or in 10 years, the reality is that ASML is not standing still. They're producing their own next generation tool in the next couple of years. And so this will be an ongoing challenge for China for the foreseeable future. Okay, let's talk about the US and the uh, European Union and the cooperation. So um, together they are investing about um, 81 billion dollars into the semiconductor industry. So do you think if Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump becomes uh, the next president of the US, do you think this cooperation will be maintained or will be broken? Well, I think first off, the US and Europe and also Japan are investing a lot of money in their chip industries for their own uh, purposes. The, the U.S. didn't pass the EU CHIPS Act and the EU didn't pass the U.S. CHIPS Act. They did it for themselves. Um, now, the good news is that there's actually a lot of alignment in their interests, um, both because companies in, Europe, the Europe, in the U.S. and Europe collaborate and because the two continents, in a lot of ways, focus on different types of chips. And so I don't think Donald Trump, if he wins, is going to dramatically change policy towards chips. Now, there might be other problems in the U.S. and European relationship that uh, could be quite consequential, but I don't think it'll be focused on, on ship issues. So as the position of Europe, in your opinion, we have three main uh, players, I would say. The US, of course, the, the Chinese and, um, and the Europeans. So are they um, like better than Chinese or where are they on the podium? Well, Europe doesn't produce a large number of chips itself, uh, but it does play a critical role in producing many of the materials and the machines that uh, produce chips. And, and that's a, a great place to be because those are very valuable parts of the supply chain, critical parts of the chip production process. But it means that when it comes to advanced chips, Europe has to import uh, many of the advanced chips that it needs. And if it's importing from the US or from Japan or from Korea, that's probably not a reason uh, to worry. But I think European firms have been asking themselves the question of how many chips they need to import from Taiwan or China. And the reality is the answer 
there's a whole lot of chips that need to be imported. And that has uh, sparked concern among European companies about their reliance on potentially uh, unreliable suppliers. Okay, let's come back to, uh, to the US and uh, competition with China. So uh, one may say that there is a um, difference between Silicon Valley and Wall Street and uh, the Washington elites. So the Washington wants to, um, to stop China in developing latest technologies, but companies maybe like Nvidia or Qualcomm want to sell their products to, um, and also Intel to, to the Chinese. So we have Intel processors in um, processing units in Huawei computers, for example, laptops. So um, do you think there's a the massive tension between Silicon Valley and Washington? There's certainly tension between Silicon Valley and Washington, but it depends where you look in Silicon Valley and where you look at in Washington. I think for US companies, the challenge they face is that China is often their largest market and simultaneously their largest competitor. And so the short-term desire to sell at times wins out over the long-term fear that they're catalyzing competition. And what Washington has tried to do over the last half decade is to put up new regulations that force companies to think twice about technological deals with China that might look good in the short term, but actually compromise America's uh, long-term edge. And what you've seen over the past half decade is a real decline in U.S. investment in China, as well as Chinese firms' ability to buy technology from the U.S. that has changed largely because of governmental regulation. So in the future, we are going to see two different separate systems. I think you won't have a complete separation, but the trend is of a bifurcation between a Western system and a Chinese system. Okay, let's discuss um, COVID-19 because it's showed how the, um, volatile and uh, let's say fragile is the, the supply and the demands uh, for semiconductors. So do you think we can expect uh, similar events in the future that are going to disrupt the, the supply chains? Um, maybe an invasion that China can, uh, can conduct uh, towards Taiwan? Well, I hope not, but I think the example of COVID showed that the entire manufacturing sector depends fundamentally on a very fragile chip supply chain. And it's not just phones, it's not just PCs, not just AI, it's, it's all manufacturing. It's dishwashers, it's cars, it's almost everything with an on-off switch. And I think most people didn't realize until COVID the extent to which the entire economy runs on chips. And once they did realize that, they suddenly began asking, well, where is it that we source our chips from? They found out that when it comes to the most advanced chips, they're almost all coming from Taiwan, which at the very same time that COVID was uh, causing havoc in supply chains, China's military was building up exactly the capabilities that would be necessary to blockade or to attack Taiwan. Yes, and uh, William Burns, the director of CIA, he said that China at the end of this decade is going to be able to conduct invasion on Taiwan. So if China does that, what happens next to the um, to the global market in general? I think if tomorrow there were any sort of military activity in the Taiwan Straits by the Chinese that led to war, you would face economic consequences in every country that would be catastrophic. Manufacturing would come to a halt. There would be freezing of the production of all types of goods, not just tech goods, but all manufacturing. Because the pandemic showed that even goods like cars, which most people don't think of as high tech, actually have hundreds or even thousands of semiconductors inside. And not all of these chips are produced in Taiwan, but many are. And without Taiwan's vast production capacity, as well as its ultra high tech capabilities, there are many types of chips that simply couldn't be sourced. So knowing that the TSMC is moving its foundries to the US, but also to Germany. Uh, so do you think this is something that will make it easier for the world uh, in, term, in, in any case of, of any disruption? I think there's no doubt that the investments that are being made right now in Japan, in the US, in Europe will add more resilience to semiconductor supply chains. But I also think we shouldn't be overconfident about the amount of investment we've made. In the US, for example, the CHIPS Act is going to spend $39 billion over the next five years to incentivize shipping facilities. TSMC in Taiwan invested almost that amount last year, and almost all of their investment happened in Taiwan. Taiwan is an absolutely central player, and despite the vast chips acts that are being passed in different countries, it's going to remain an important player for a very long time. So they do that because of um, geopolitical situation, so they want to be needed for the world, so they won't be attacked by, by the Chinese, and they will be protected by the US. The Taiwanese called this the Silicon Shield. Their argument is that if they produce the chips that everyone else needs, the U.S. will come to their aid in case China attacks.
So do you think this is something that uh, Poland should follow, the example of, of Taiwan or South Korea? Because I think in terms of population, we are similar uh, countries in terms of geopolitical situation as well, because we have a, a big, big enemy next to us. So uh, and maybe we can, let's say, make use of this situation that um, some companies are trying to build foundries somewhere else than in Taiwan just to, uh, to improve our security. Well, I think the Taiwanese are overconfident in the Silicon Shield. I think they've invested too much in the Silicon Shield and not enough in their military. And today, I think uh, there's increasing realization in Taiwan and in the rest of the world that Taiwan's military looks too weak and that their central role in the chip industry looks as much like a vulnerability as it does an asset. And so to me, the Silicon Shield is not something to replicate. It's a, a cautionary tale that you shouldn't invest in industry at the expense of your own defense. But um, do you think Poland should um, make investments in or attract somehow try to attract investments in semiconductor industry? Because right now we don't have any foundry located in, in Poland. I think every country's got to invest where it has a comparative advantage. And not every country in the world can be a major player in the foundry space. Not every country can be a major player in the lithography space. You've got to invest where you've got a comparative uh, advantage. And so uh, I, I, I get cautious when I hear political leaders say we must become a leader in semiconductor manufacturing unless they've done How their much homework. money does it need to well, be a leader? It's a, just... Billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars. And so for some countries that makes sense, but for many it does not. So what makes sense for Poland in, in your opinion? I don't know, maybe software engineering or, or what, what is it that can make us special? Well, I would say first off, Poland has already succeeded in attracting investment in advanced chip packaging capabilities. So after a chip's manufactured, it's got to be put in an increasingly high tech package before it's sent off to the final device. So it's Intel. Intel which, has, mm -hmm. has done that, that's right. And then in chip design, uh, which is how you actually lay out a chip. Uh, I think there's extraordinary growth potential around the world because design is one of the key drivers of technological improvements. And chip design is actually not a manufacturing, it's, it's more of a software or programming type of activity. And it doesn't consume a lot of capital. It consumes almost no capital. All you need is work, workers and an internet connection and you can start designing chips. So we need to use our brains, That's as right. simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Sarah. It was extremely interesting talking to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Dziękuję także, że Państwo byli z nami. To był profesor Chris Miller z Fletcher School na Tufts University. I oczywiście, jak już mówiłem, autor niezwykłej książki Wielka wojna o chipy. Dziękuję Państwu i do zobaczenia.